Hello, bonjour, and welcome to the Don't Twist Water podcast. I'm your host, Antoine Valter, and today I have a very special edition of that podcast because I have not one, not two, but much more guests which came to that microphone. The reason is pretty simple. I'm here in Vancouver for the Mutech Forum under this very intriguing team of radical collaboration for regeneration. I had the chance to speak with several people which came on that very microphone and shared their thoughts on the topic and beyond. And without further ado, I let you discover the wisdom they shared. Hi Menno, welcome to this mini version of the show. Hi Kimberly, welcome Hello. to that mini version of the show. <laughs> Hi John, welcome to that mini version of the show. Hi there, it's great to be here. Hi Sneal, thanks for stopping by my microphone. I have a couple of questions for you. The first one is what attracted you to this theme of radical collaboration for regeneration? First of all, thanks for uh, the conversation Antoine. There's a few things about just the topic alone that uh, really hits to the core of how we at Evoke would think about business, but actually how I've thought about it for a long time, which is you can only go so far by yourself, but together we can go further. I think collaboration really is the core of what we're all seeking to be able to get together with like-minded, compatible, complementary partners to be able to help us on this journey of change in the water industry. The radical nature of it is actually, I think, that we, we sometimes think of traditional partners in the world where we're working and living in watersheds and ecosystems. Sometimes we don't bring all those stakeholders into the conversation. And I think that's what we're seeing here in uh, Vancouver is not just the traditional water industry talking uh, amongst itself, but getting the end users involved, NGOs involved, listening to politicians. I mean, there's, there's, there's a, a dynamic that's actually most important. Important, I think to get every everybody into the mix because ultimately everybody in that mix is going to have to have something that they can do to help move the whole issue forward. The theme I think is really reflecting what we believe is necessary to solve some of the demanding water challenges around the world. We as a sector, the water sector has improved a lot over the last decade but if we really want to solve the water challenges and if we look into that very dynamic situation around the globe, the negative impact of too much or too little water, climate change, and geopolitical situation, the fact that many people still don't have access to clean water, a lot of industries which are limited at the moment in growth simply because there's not enough water available. There is a lot we need to do in order to get water the value it deserves, which is also part of our mission water. We believe that the radical collaboration in order to regenerate the planet is, is necessary. We have to have radical collaboration to get to where we need to go with the speed which we need to get there so that we can really change the trajectory of water in the context of, of climate as we're seeing so much of our climate change through changes in water. I think there's more than one thing going on there in that in that theme. I was fortunate enough to be actually be part of the advisors to the forum uh, to try and decide like what, what do we want to try and tackle and things like that. So when Paul introduced that as his concept, I think we all thought a little bit differently about it. And the one thing that I kept coming back to was, well, there's the radical piece, which I look at more as, look, if we're going to do something radical, then we have to get out of our comfort zones because you're not going to change unless you get out of that zone and you try something new and different. So for me, that's really the radical part of that. The collaboration part for me is essential no matter what. From an innovation standpoint, which a lot of this event circulates around innovation, right? You can't have true innovation or speed of innovation without collaboration. So I think having collaboration in there is critical to be the catalyst for innovation. But collaboration does not happen without the interaction of the people. It's all tied together very well. The regenerative part, I think that was the real interesting part of how this theme came together. Because if you look at, at themes of the past or of other conferences, events, and things like that, it's about, yeah, like we can, we can make things better or less bad than they once were. But when you think of the regeneration aspects, then you're, you're truly looking at it as more of a dynamic change. And this is the way that you can really make it more sustainable for long periods of time. Radical collaboration is really the core of our modus operandi at Tomorrow Water. We're not a huge company and 
we have very big aspirations, and the only way to achieve those aspirations on a global scale is to partner with other innovators and thought leaders like we find here at this event. We've known Paul for a long time. Um, he sits on the board of our Tomorrow Water project, and it's really been a pleasure to help make this uh, come to fruition. After 10 years that uh, we haven't been able to participate before, we're really excited about taking advantage of this opportunity now. So when you pull that all together, I think, I think there's just so much to unpack. And I think throughout uh, the course of the event so far, we've been tackling all the different components and pieces of that. So for me, it was very exciting. Radical collaboration is something that we really need right now as we're, for lack of a better word, brushing off the dust and getting back into in-person contact. So much of the last two and a half years has been behind computer screens and sure, Teams meetings and huddles over message and so on are great, but actually collaborating requires meeting each other and sometimes talking to the person next to you who is not in your organization and learning their perspective, which may be completely different than your perspective, but really give you something to think about and try to implement yourself in your day-to-day -day work. How do you bring that radical collaboration home at Evoqua? Well, I, I think it starts with just the willingness to partner, whether it's partnering very much with our customers and not just make it a tendering uh, situation, but really working with them to understand their goals, understanding sort of where their pain points are, figuring out what their risk uh, appetites are, but really just that dialogue, right? But that's just on the customer side. We also think about it from a technology perspective. Well, we have a number of technologies in-house, we don't have everything, and we're often willing to look at our own solutions, say, is that really the best answer? And when you don't have the best answer, then you turn into the market, you turn into a supply chain, you turn into, say, complementary providers to look for ways to put together a holistic solution. There might have been a time where one thought, well, I'm only going to use my stuff. But the complexities are so great now, and the innovation has uh, continued to uh, evolve. So it's very difficult for any one company to have everything, and so the collaboration is how we go about doing that, even when it comes to putting together solutions for customers. It's something we're doing already at Evoqua. I think this just gives me more impetus to make sure that we continue that journey because uh, there's quite a bit more we can do. You've been opening the session on innovation this morning yes. with all these companies, 20 companies that pitch for 20 times one minute. Yeah. Is that the way that Suez looks at this collaboration by thinking that's a way to enhance innovation? I think it's a piece of the equation for sure. It's not the only piece of the equation, but it's definitely a piece. Is it the key piece? Collaboration for sure is a key piece. Who we collaborate, how we collaborate, and and to what level we collaborate, that's where it's, uh, it may be a little bit different. So for example, there's some aspects of innovation that we do that's highly, highly confidential and we've got very small teams working on very sophisticated technologies and you really have to do it that way for large companies and for companies to protect their intellectual property. But there's certain degrees of, of innovation that go beyond sort of that intricate core of, of technology development where you do need or you should want to partner with others on a, on a much more open basis because you can spurn a lot of creativity and you can combine technologies that may exist somehow, some way in our portfolio with technologies that exist with other companies into something that more makes a, you know, a one plus one equals three type of equation. And that's where, uh, you know, an event like this where, where, where we get to meet and potentially collaborate with a lot of, in some cases, smaller startup companies or other companies that are just working on something new and sophisticated and they have a piece of the equation, but not the whole solution. Well, certainly, I mean, Bright Blue World is a good one. Just having met Paul from years ago and uh, him coming to me with this idea of a documentary for positive, optimistic story with really nothing more than a few pages on a PDF. I was just inspired by the concept and this idea of talking about solutions versus just the doom and gloom like there's nothing we can do. That was somewhat serendipitous and then there was just sort of a snowball effect of how that film ended up being you know so successful and attracted you know star power and Hollywood power I and mean, who would have known I mean he's a researcher I'm a you know chemical engineer turned marketer like who would have known something that would have happened? I think I shared yesterday uh, many examples of projects which were probably a couple of years ago not possible. And only when bringing together all the different stakeholders 
and convincing each of them and trying to find the right way. We have been able to solve some of these water challenges. For example, water reuse. It's a common topic which people think it's something only for countries which are really facing droughts around the equator. But you see now everywhere and also in Europe, many countries which are facing droughts. And I showed you the example yesterday of one of the largest uh, poultry processing plants in the world who is at the moment fully depending on reuse of all the treated effluent in order to meet their clean water and drinking water demands. If you look into resource recovery, you see that uh, that was a topic 10 years ago, which was very high on the agenda of the Bluetech research team and, and Paul's own vision to, hey, how are we going to, to get resource recovery really implemented? And now there are technologies, now there are full-scale references, there are business cases, which especially now with the higher energy prices, for example, are, are going to accelerate and, and, and create more opportunities. And this is I think just to name a couple of examples of radical collaboration where different stakeholders, public, private, universities, uh, institutes, suppliers have to work in a different way together than we are used to. So the very traditional way of, let's say, an end user working together with a consultant to solve some of the challenges and then bringing a tender to the market, yeah, that's changing. We have a lot of clients who are seeking our active advice and help. It's okay, this is the challenge. Looking into the future, it will become even more challenging. Regulations are becoming more or stronger. Unexpected developments, global economy, supply chain restrictions, pandemics. Clients are looking today more for, let's say, flexible solutions, modular solutions, and new technology, real innovations, game-changing innovations, which are gaining attention and, and market share to you, you mentioned these new technologies and, and the combination of all of those and having probably the right portfolio to bring the right solution at any place. That is something where your company has been quite active over yeah. the past months. Is that another way to look at radical collaboration? You're collaborating with always more companies which join your Nihus family. No, that's, that's true. Eh? That started already when, when Nias and Sewer decided to join ties two years ago in order to build a strong European industrial powerhouse. And with the very rapid expansion and all the acquisitions we have successfully completed over the last, uh, let's say, 12 months, we are indeed expanding our knowledge base, the experience. We have learned that local presence is absolutely critical, especially also during the COVID pandemic. Clients were fully relying on the local technical support in order to get their plans up and running or keep them running and, and provide all the necessary technical support. We need to make sure that we have access to the technology for the future. And we are building what we call our one-stop shop for water on demand, where we are very critically looking which technologies really have the future in order to deal with all those challenges many of our industrial and municipal clients are facing around the world. That comprehensive portfolio which we now have uh, developed and built together is going to be the basis for the future, especially as we see that more and more clients are also asking us to take more responsibility. And as a system integrator and a solutions provider, we don't want to rely on promises of others. We want to know the core technologies by heart. We also have a strategy that we manufacture as much as possible ourselves with our global manufacturing facilities. We're expanding at the moment and building one of the, we're going to build one of the largest manufacturing sites in, in Europe, in the Netherlands. We're expanding in Italy. With the recent acquisition of Aquagem in the United States, we're now also starting up our manufacturing capability in, in Knoxville, Tennessee. It's really globalizing, but at the same time, we need to make sure that we have the right knowledge about the technologies which are commonly applied in, in the different regions and work on the innovations for the future. You want to be globally local because people yeah. want to be closer to, to their suppliers. You want to go over the full vertical and to deliver not just one piece of the puzzle, but really a solution which really connects to them. And you want to, to stay radically in innovative, to stay yeah. on top of the game. You said comprehensive solutions. Do I have to understand that your, your journey is over? You don't have more announcements in your pockets? <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't be afraid. No, no. It depends from industry to industry. If you look, for example, in the food industry, to solve the water challenges over there, it requires a slightly different portfolio of technologies than, for example, in the renewable energy space. We're quite successful also now in the semiconductor electronic manufacturing. There also, we, we need to have different technologies which we did not have in our portfolio. That's one of the reasons why we acquired Aquagem. Historically, NIA is, is coming from the wastewater treatment. Uh, we developed over the last eight years more into process water reuse. But in order to close the water loop, we also needed to have leading technologies in our portfolio on the clean water side and the ultra pure water side. Now, that has been the reason, for example, for that acquisition now recently in the United States. If we look into um, Veolia Mobile Water Services, we see a, a huge 
growing demand either to deal with emergencies or to help clients out for the next two, three, four years. We see a lot of clients who don't know, given all the uncertainties at the moment around the globe, what uh, their manufacturing requirements will be one year from now, two years from now. But they still, they need to fulfill the legal obligations. Temporary mobile solution is a perfect, uh, perfect alternative. Uh, and for us, it means eight, nine years ago, we started to basically transform Nyhuis from a system supplier into a solution provider. And now with the help of Sure and EQT, who is uh, the main investor in, in, in the Sure company and the largest European in infrastructure investor, we're also carefully looking into uh, the growing demand for water as a service. So more and more clients who ask us to basically finance, operate and maintain on their behalf. Given the growing complexity of remove, reuse, reduce, recover, the change in regulations, they want to rely on strong, reliable partners. That comprehensive portfolio of technologies is helping us because I think today nine out of ten clients we can help solving their water challenges. But we will keep looking. That's also one of the reasons why we are here looking for that holy grail or that great brilliant idea which is going to basically replace one of our leading technologies. If you engage with those companies what is the kind of engagement you can I mean there's not only acquisition there's also partnership there's also smaller stage investment. Yeah. What's your politic? That's a very good question and, and first of all we are very proud that one of the companies which we believe is one of the most promising scale-ups is also actively today uh, presenting their value proposition, similar sanitation. That's an example how we are working with promising startups. I think we are not the right partner for, for real startups. We support, we help a lot of entrepreneurs if they pass by say, hey, can you reflect on our ideas? What's your view? We rate companies, we scout startup companies, but really when we believe that a company is ready to scale up, when we can bring them to the, the global market. So we can help promising startups to really scale up. And that is what we are what we are doing now. So, uh, so rather in growth stage, not in yeah. the early stage. Not in the very early stage. Okay. When it's really radical, when we say, okay, this is something to jump on, we will consider that. We are following two, three opportunities today. Mostly we are looking for companies where we can bring that technology to the global market. So one of the recent acquisitions of Biosis, for example, who is leading in nitrogen recovery. It's a new technology. We looked at them already for a couple of years and I have decided to develop some alternative technologies themselves. And now it's the right time to really join forces and scale up this alternative for destroying nitrogen and recover fertilizer from nitrogen directly. Now it's the momentum to really scale up and make this technology the preferred technology for municipal and industrial clients in the future. That is really where we are trying to work together with the right people, which we can help and who can help us solving these very demanding water challenges. Would be your elevator pitch to Tomorrow Water? Tomorrow Water leverages a portfolio of really unique technologies that are all paradigm shifting technologies focused on the future water challenges. Whether it's our Animox and thermal hydrolysis technologies, which are helping to achieve the vision of true net energy positive wastewater treatment. Wastewater treatment is an energy producing system. Or whether that's our Proteus biofilter platform, which is leading on climate friendly solutions for carbon diversion, for uh, wet weather treatment, for stormwater flows, wet weather flows, or even reclamation of precious public spaces by really taking treatment plants and turning them into public parks and other valuable infrastructure. Might be a public space and in some cases with our new CoFlow project really integrating other industries for a true industrial circular ecosystem. What would be your elevator pitch to Aquatech? Aquatech is a provider of water technology as a service to help customers sustain their sustainability goals. We really try to provide water technology in, at a predictable cost. And when we talk about water technology as a service, we really talk about holistically giving not just the technology, but the know-how. As a company, Aquatech has always led with their technology. We don't want to just provide the technology in, a, in, an, in isolation. We want to work through the complete solution while leading with the technology. So that includes offering our know-how, working with a customer, and understanding their operations, integrating digital, integrating operation control and other types of mechanisms and offering it at a predictable cost. So much of a plant's challenges are faced after the plant is in operation. So working to give an end-to-end -end solution that leads with the technology is really what we want to do. And that requires offering it as a service. So not just putting the technology in and walking away. Radical collaboration, Uh, is really how we get there.
when we discuss Evoqua, if you look at a terrible example of, of a company failing, you look at US Filter. US Filter plus Veolia was a failure. US Filter plus Siemens didn't work that well. And then everybody's like, oh, that company is doomed. And then a couple of years later, you have Evoqua, which is one of the most striving companies right now in, in, in the water scene. Mm -hmm. And it's the same company. What changed, it sounds to be the culture, the collaboration within the company. I think it's, an, it's a reasonable observation. I think historically it's a very reasonable observation. I think a few things have changed and it's absolutely the culture. It started with the private equity owners that, that came in when they bought the business from Siemens, but really most importantly the management team they put in place. And mind you, I wasn't there at the time so I'm not speaking on, wow, I, it was great. I was actually very keenly watching the situation because as far back as 30 years ago, my first sales job was selling Ion Exchange and RO to to a legacy U.S. filter company. And so I've watched the journey. But what is different now is a maniacal focus on the customer, which I don't think was the case previously. There was just this idea that, well, we have everything, let's go buy things, really more internally focused. I think it's also a management operating style that is very agile. You know, having discipline of execution, meeting your commitments. We focus much more on service than ever because customers, particularly in the industrial sector, Water is not their business. Water is a means to an end. And so they're looking for reliable partners and that focus on making sure we're reliable, we're close to where the action is, we have an operating system that actually focuses on those real operational metrics, very diligent about our, our acquisitions so that's not random but it's filling problems and gaps in our roadmaps around technology or market. All of that has turned into the secret sauce, if you will. And, and I think the other thing to point out is that our business has evolved to the point where 70% of our business is in industrial, maybe 30 in municipal. And within the industrial segment, there's no one end market. It's healthcare, it's pharma, it's power, it's food and beverage, it's semiconductor. And that diversity of end market has also really served us well when it comes to resilience and earnings and execution and scale of the senior management team and really if you go down a level these are not in water industry veterans these are people that have come from other industries that have been attracted to water but they bring a different operational mindset and I think all of that has gone into what is currently our, our pathway with Evoqua. ecosystem of um, small companies, innovative companies, early stage startups, growth stage startups. What is the relationship you want to have as USWTS with, with that ecosystem? In the digital space, things are moving very, very quickly. There's so many players that are trying something new, something different, and it's a rapid pace of development. So when you're, when you're thinking about the digital ecosystems, there's not one piece that's going to be like, okay, now we, we've got digital solved, right? There's not one code or one bit of software or whatever. It truly is an ecosystem. So it's how well you put all these different parts and pieces together and how well you can integrate them so that they're talking to each other. When you look at smaller startup companies that are doing, for example, digital types of things, and you already have an ecosystem and an infrastructure and you can bolt something on and interweave it into your plans, that's pretty advantageous. And it certainly is for us with the way that we operate. You mentioned how you, you try to work with your customers and how it starts with their challenges and then you try to find the solutions. To that extent, your approach to sustainability is very interesting because there's the footprint, which everybody talks about. I mean, how can I do good with my footprint? Yeah. But as a water company, solving the footprint is pretty easy. I'm putting brackets on easy, but still it's pretty easy. We don't mm -hmm. have that much of impact ourselves or the company. Mm -hmm. But you're walking a different talk, saying, yes, we solve the footprint, but we also go for the handprints which is much more ambitious. Yeah, and I think the way we've talked about this is that when I talk about handprint and when we talk about handprint is Evoqua, what we say is our ability to deliver either a product technology or an entire solution is enabling something for the customer. Now, they may have water goals, so we're helping them meet their water goals. They may have energy goals, and by the way, the water system is a contributor to that. I'll give you a really simple example, uh, data centers. 
data centers are using water, using quite a bit, but if they choose the right technology and they keep the water clean enough, the reduction of fouling in a cooling tower goes toward energy, which goes toward their carbon footprint. The translation we're trying to make now is that our handprint is more than just a water story. Our handprint can be an energy story. Our handprint can be a food story. Water is at the center of those conversations, but what are we really trying to do? We're reducing food miles. We're actually reducing the intensity of energy of transport in general. That's where we're going. We're saying, look, the, the, the water is a pathway to being able to meet some of your other goals. Fundamentally, what we're finding out is that many of the customers in those markets are not water experts. And they're looking for a trusted partner to help them figure out what are my options here. And that's where the handprint really is starting to show up pretty convincingly. We've had a way to dimensionalize the impact of water beyond the traditional gallons, quality, capex, opex. I mean, that's all true. The compounding effect of that handprint is amplified when you think about what is that company able to do? How are they achieving? The best examples over the last three years are our ability as a company, because we were servicing some of the pharmaceutical companies making the vaccines, they were not necessarily all prepared for the amount of water they were gonna start using. And we were able to monitor those with electronics, we were bringing in mobile equipment, we were keeping them moving, and that allowed them to keep the timelines. Now you translate into lives, that's a handprint story that nobody can really put a number to, but it's, it's an impactful one. We are part of the first French company who took uh, a green loan. We are committed to, to reduce the water consumption. We are committed to change from fossil fuel to renewable energy. We're investing a lot in order to make sure that uh, we have an equal workforce between women and, 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 and men. That is an incredible example of radical collaboration. You have this flagship partnership with data centers. Can you tell me a bit about it? Sure. So far, we've already established partnerships with Arcadis. It's an engineering consultancy that knows how to design data centers as well as wastewater treatment plants. We're also partnering with Samsung. We are looking at this concept of siting a data center on top of a wastewater treatment plant. There's a lot of fantastic synergies that can occur when you take those two elements and put them together. First of all, location. Data centers would love to be close to the heart of the processing action especially in a lot of new edge computing applications, close to the fiber backbone in the heart of these urban centers. And that's where we have, of course, aging wastewater infrastructure that is desperately in need of upgrade. On top of that, data centers need cooling, and there's no better heat sink, really an unlimited heat sink, of tremendous flows through these wastewater treatment plants. So we can utilize that for cooling. We can actually upgrade the plant with resources available from the project and produce more reuse water than is needed for the data center. And so the data center can actually become net water positive, producing water for the community while achieving its cooling needs. Additionally, wastewater treatment plants, as I mentioned, we're interested in turning wastewater treatment into an energy production plant. By integrating new co-digestion facilities, we can produce megawatts of clean energy that then the data center can utilize to become less carbon intensive or maybe even carbon neutral. When it comes to that handprint topic, do you have to educate them and to come and say, look, you can be doing that, that, that and that? Or do they actively come to you and say, hey, we are committed to some pledges and we would seek some help? It's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both. But I think the most success we've seen is where a company has already made a commitment or has already shown an indication of wanting to go on this journey. But oftentimes they don't have all the answers of how they're going to get there. And they don't think about it that way because they haven't gone and done the work, the math. And, and I'm not saying that they wouldn't know how to do it, but they just haven't had the time. And saying, look, if you use A versus B, take, for example, using UV instead of chemicals for getting to disinfection. When you look at the embedded carbon inside that chemical uh, solution, yes, it works. But if you were to switch to UV in some cases, you not only are going to minimize the chemical burden, but you've also increased reliability because you're not waiting for the next tanker to arrive and you haven't exposed yourself to supply chain. There's a lot of other things, right? But if you don't put all of those things on a piece of paper to show these are all the things that are possible if you choose A versus B, they don't have the time to come up with all that on their own. But it's in the case where they've already made a goal and people are like, well, we don't know how we're going to get there. That's really the, the best ground because uh, you get motivation. And then the other case where 
they don't have all of that laid out. And then you lay it out in front of them, and mostly that turns into an environment. It turns into an economic ROI that happens to have an environmental ROI with it. Because if I'm saving you energy, then that's money. If I'm helping you reduce the amount of water you buy from the local municipality or get charged by the waste facility, that's an ROI. But did they accomplish water recycle while they were at it? Maybe, and maybe they now have a water goal that they can speak to that they might not have done before. In all cases, it's going to need to be an economic ROI. It's just how do you put enough of that on the table for them to get the credit for having taken a different path. footage from a wastewater treatment plant it's always taken from the sky and it's always beautiful and you brought that just into light with the, those pictures of, of the fence which is what we really see of a wastewater treatment plant first that's brilliant marketing and that's brilliant message because it's crisp and everybody gets it beyond that do you think your approach of making this wastewater treatment underground and, and regenerating the space on top of it do you see that becoming mainstream and to which extent Well, we hope so. I'll say that the core of our technologies are all intended for and do achieve, you know, cost parity and competitiveness, even in classic treatment trains. You know, in North America, it's not as common right now to put wastewater treatment underground, and we're selling into that market. We're coming in for advanced primary treatment applications, for secondary upgrades, a lot of different plant upgrades that they're not underground, but it meets the needs of the plant. So first of all, the baseline is you have to be competitive. On top of that, being able to leverage the added value to a community to then go ahead and build on top of that is really where the extra value is. So in order to do that, people have to, to see that value. When I started working with Tomorrow Water, I came on board with this company about five years ago. The first thing I did is to fly to Korea and go to one of these flagship plants. I was used to plants where you come in and there's a, a fence and you have to talk to the security guy and then you know he calls somebody and then the gate, the, the fence slowly opens and then you walk in. Well, it was a totally different experience. I got there to Seoul and we got off of the, the bus and we literally walked into a facility There was a wastewater treatment museum. We did a little tour. We went upstairs. We had a cappuccino overlooking the beautiful park. And then we went outside and we sat on a park bench on top of the primary filter. And we, you couldn't tell where we were. So that's a very inspirational experience. And it's an inspirational experience for people that have it. But it's an even more amazing experience for the people that are there for other reasons. Because if you have a business that's next door to that facility, if you have a home that's next door to that facility, you have a completely different interaction with that public service. So there are starting to be more and more projects that try to integrate these critical infrastructure elements into the urban landscape and really reclaim public space or reclaim land for other high value uses. What I love about that book, Flourish, I suggest you read it if you, if you can get your hands on it, is really this idea of changing a mindset and that really the change of mindset is, is really going to make the difference and it can potentially make the difference quickly and showing some of those models of how that can happen and some examples to give you sort of hope and uh, the visualization that, that this can happen. The idea of a mindset shift really struck me. The book and the full concept is, is zooming out from the water industry. Mm -hmm. How counterintuitive is it as a water company like Dupont? to have that, that zoom out and look a bit broader. Well, that's one of the benefits of, of an event like this, and certainly the way Blue Tech is thinking about it is bringing in these other disciplines, right, so that we can learn from each other, from you know people who are studying space, people who are studying from the built environment to native communities, and I think those are always the best events where you're starting to think about other you know, sort of disciplines and how to bring those in. And Flourish is a good example. So it's really, it's coming from the perspective of the, of the built environment, but the principles can be applied to the water space. And in, in a sense, a lot of what we're doing in water is in essential, the, the built environment, right? So we in, interact with water in our buildings. To me, there's a really direct connection there um, with water in the built environment. We've touched a bit on how Evoqua has been on a transformative path over the past, let's say, decade. In the future now, Evoqua in five or ten years, what's success for you on that time horizon? You know, it's funny. I, 
I wouldn't want to put it in any terms that minimizes what the ambition can be. I think we've been very disciplined in the types of business that we are in. I think we're thinking a little bit more about really there's also human behavior and conservation and, and other elements to the story that maybe we haven't always been a part of. But I think more holistically is that in, in five years, I would anticipate that for sure we're a bigger company, but more importantly that the type of work we're doing is actually showing just a four, five, ten x impact of what it is that we're delivering. And I can tell you right now, not every market that we're playing in is going to yield that type of opportunity. When I talk about the macro trends driving all of us, water and climate risk, health and safety, and digitalization, we're using those as guideposts, which is, is the end market that we are serving being driven by those activities? If so, how are we helping them tackle the challenge, meet the, meet the moment of growth? You know, life sciences to me is an incredible space that so desperately needs water technology and, and, and technologists because their challenge is also tremendous. The convergence of working on those things, the energy transition that we're in, and what that means to the, 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 the shutting down of old power and bringing on new power, getting into the hydrogen economy. I can go on. There are new industries emerging right now that are all going to need a partner. And so five years from now, the portfolio will look different because we're serving the needs of some new players. I'm excited because there's just a lot of room, but we have to be focused. And that's really, I think, been what's got us here. So the focus will still continue. Oh, that's a very, that's a very good question. In the boardroom in, in Paris, we just reviewed the, the growth strategy for our group. We basically want to grow to, to at least 3 billion. By the end of this year, we will manage altogether to grow to 2 billion. So that's a magnificent growth for sure over the last three years. The ambition is that industry is going to grow to at least 1, 1.1 billion in the years to come, uh, which will be a combination of, of organic growth, where we are doing very well over the first three months of this year. We have been growing with, I believe, 51.3% organic growth. So so that's really record high. Yeah, we are very proud of, of, of that. We will continue with adding acquisitions, especially to strengthen ourselves in areas where we don't have sufficient feet on the street. So the Middle East and Asia are definitely areas where we want to grow. We're still looking into industries or applications where we cannot offer the full solution today. When we are looking into desalinated water, for example, we can supply only the pretreatment, but we are not actively today in the full cycle, no, especially for small and medium-sized brine treatment. We're investing a lot in that to come up with some radical solutions over there. Water reuse, resource recovery, there's still a lot of area where what we have today is fantastic, but it needs to be expanded. Over, over time. There is still a lot for us to do. We want to grow at least to 1 billion in the coming years. We see that a lot of the industrial end users around the world are looking for strong global players. I remember that we started with Nyhuis uh, eight years ago, relatively small. Sewer started, uh, I think the, the revenue of Sewer for industry was 20 million uh, euro uh, two, three years ago. We're reaching the three, 350 very soon, half a billion in the next 18 months. So it's, it's rapid growth. We see that a lot of clients like to work with us, they like us being more innovative than others. And I think with the big merge between some of our global competitors, there's a big push for strong number two and three players around the globe with a dedicated, specialized focus in our case on industrial water solutions. It's a complex time for you know my particular business unit right now, Suez Water Technologies and Solutions. Veolia is our major shareholder right now. However, we're eagerly waiting for the regulatory approvals to come through completely so that we can begin the transition process. We just have to get through a few more of those hurdles and then we'll, we'll get into that process. And I think once that's done, we'll have a more clear picture on how we're going to go about doing that venture type of stuff that we used to do as Suez. It's funny you mention the merger of number one and number two in the world because you were rumored to be also in the talks for sales, for mergers that came out a couple of months ago. Let me give you a stupid idea and then you, you can tell me uh, it is fully stupid and uh, I never dare to, to say that again, but Veolia acquires Suez and takes out all the industrial part of Suez, which is no part of Veolia. So now you have a little Suez, which is left with absolutely no industrial or almost no industrial force anymore. Next to it, you have Soar Industry, Nihus, which used to be a small player three years ago, as you mentioned, at 20 million, which now is on a fantastic and exponential growth, which is really that, that growth stage, which you would see from, from a scale up, but from an historic company, so it's kind of crazy. And I'm just wondering, if you bring those two together, 
Well, basically, you have the next giant which can compete with the other giant in the making. Is that fully stupid? <laughs> There, there, there's a lot of speculation in the market uh, about uh, who is who is going to, to to like who in the future, who needs who to become stronger. I think what for us counts, and it's also probably a reflection on your first uh, indirect question about the, the, some of the recent news about EQT. For us, what really counts is um, the quality of the investor. With EQT today, we have an amazing investor who is putting the bar very high on uh, CSR, who is really only investing in companies which are going to contribute to a better world in the future. EQT is really helping us with a lot of knowledge and experience to, to globalize. So what counts for us on this high growth path for the Sure Group? We want to grow and exceed the 3 billion. It's important that we are being supported by the right shareholders and you need to know your way in order to be successful. And that's only possible when you have the, the right investment attitude uh, and when we can put together also the right team. At the end of the day, uh, our clients are the most important. Uh, they pay for our services. They like to work with us. Uh, we're always open for any partnership. We're always open for any collaboration. I could not imagine that we were working so successfully together with a French corporate a couple of years ago when I was attending the previous uh, Bluetech forum and we're doing fantastic things all together. But the mix of people, the understanding of the market, understanding the trends, anticipating on the trends, that is important. If your company is successful, then you're always an attractive target for investors. We'd like to be really innovating around the world, spreading our footprint out and bringing some of the vision of our integrated portfolio technologies into a more circular economy. Supporting things like co-digestion and advanced digestion projects with thermal hydrolysis, Anamox. But even more than that, one of the visions of our company through things like the Tomorrow Water Project is trying to develop solutions that are appropriate at all different levels of the income pyramid. So we're really focused on SDG6 and we're looking forward to piloting some new projects using some of our future looking technologies not just for the most developed communities but for communities around the world that are experiencing the global sanitation crisis. When you say optimizing the water use do you have like a metrics in mind which would tell us that we're successful in 2025 or 2030? Well what we've started to do is um, last year we launched the with the Economist Intelligence Unit which is now called Economist Impact the City Water Optimization Index. So this is applied to cities, but it's 48 indicators across accessibility, reliability, and sustainability to help a city understand kind of where it's at. We've started with 50 cities. It's a free, open tool. Anybody can go and look at it and play with it. You can change different levers and see how that changes the score, things like that. But what it does is it sets up at least a framework of measurement and a, and a benchmark. So what we want to do is move towards, you know, additional cities, but also like a, a benchmarking tool that anyone can put their own data in and understand where they are across those 48 indicators. So we really want to start there. We know as DuPont, there's only, you know, we need to partner. We're not going to solve the whole thing ourselves. But, um, but the city index, I think, is a good one to start with in terms of a framework for measurement. And so I think if you look out in a 10-year span, you need to redirect your goals that direction. So I think in 10 years, we will be much more a part of the ecosystem and not just trying to amend it or treat it or make it better or different. Do you see what I mean? <laughs>
Blue Tech Forum doesn't have to be a thing. It doesn't have to be a place. It can be an experience. It can go on. You know, for the longest time, I used to think about trade shows as being one of the more inefficient ways for people to get together. It limited you. It said, how many people from my company can I send? Really, is that the decision maker if you're there looking for clients? Are all clients that would like to come able to come? And the answer is on all those questions is no. Is there a better way? I mean, this is another example, which is I'm sure there were more people that wanted to come to Blue Tech Forum than were able to come. So how do we kind of do that online, offline? I think we're learning, but this this face-to-face -face definitely is a way to rekindle some of that and then keep the momentum going. You're just bumping into people and having conversations that you're sort of meant to have, right? And then you just start kind of sparking ideas and different things that you can potentially do together. And after you leave, you can continue those discussions and ideally they turn into partnerships. I mean, that's how so much of what has already been accomplished, how it's been accomplished through some of the serendipity and, and follow on and, and really coming together on these ideas. It's amazing. You know, I think that we leveraged the digital revolution of, of COVID pretty well in terms of keeping relationships going with our existing partners. But in order to meet new people and really forge relationships, I, I think you have to be in person. And there's another aspect people don't talk about. I mean, they go to conferences to get in information. They go to conferences to get updates, but the, the level of, of kind of inspiration of Spark that you can get by in-person sitting, watching the presentations, and then having discussions in the flesh with multiple people around the table. Sometimes you got to get excited, you got to talk over one another. That brings some of the energy into the, into the conversation and it's just not possible over Zoom. So we're really excited to be here to draw inspiration from the amazing location here in Vancouver and from the wonderful group of people that are, that are out here. Some of the partnerships that we can make out of this will be really beneficial. Some of the technologies we may see we can integrate and provide a better solution for our customers. Some of the conversations we have in a hallway may become uh, a really good friendship or relationship that we can use to implement uh, something together for the end customer. To round out these uh, conversations, I have two rapid fire questions. Okay. It's time for the rapid fire questions. The first one is, can you name one thing that you've learned the hard way? Don't fall in love with the idea. One thing I learned the hard way is that you need to bring your key stakeholders into your thinking early on. And if you don't do that, you have a high probability of your idea being rejected or just having a lot more trouble implementing it or getting buy-in. So I learned that the hard way. <laughs> When you're coming in to bring in a new technology, sometimes you have to take responsibility for things that even are, aren't under your scope. I mean, basically you have to do everything to make sure a project succeeds. And, and we've had to take hits or make up for mistakes on, on outside of our scope, on the contracting side, on other areas. And, and it's just something that has to happen because in order to deploy a new technology in a new market, it just has to be successful at every stage of the game. So, you know, we're not expecting that. I had to learn it the hard way. It's something that maybe the lawyers think they can, they can sort of contract away but it's it's not real because ultimately you have to succeed. No news is not good news. I think that's something that I've learned the hard way. Sometimes it's really, really important to stay really connected with the customer and really develop that relationship because if you're not communicating constantly with people, um, silence can be deadly and it leads to gaps in communication, gaps in understanding, which can lead to a lot of problems down the line. So I think Always stay connected with your customers and don't just say that, oh, I talked to them six months ago, so everything should be fine. I uh, recently became a guitar player within the last few years. And I tried to teach myself by watching YouTube videos, and it didn't go so well. <laughs> so I gave in and I, and I found myself a, uh, an actual teacher and it accelerated uh, my, uh, my learning much, much better. So that's another example of radical collaboration. You, you cannot go alone. You, you right. need to find guides Absolutely. on the way. It's all about the people. You can have great technology. You can have a fantastic ID. If you don't have the right people to implement it, to realize it, it's not going to fly. And my second is, what's the very, very, very latest thing you've learned? I heard something this morning, and I don't know that I got it right completely, but that a problem is actually just a solution in disguise. The perspective that the speaker gave was, I thought, very insightful because it says, well, okay, don't live in it, 
but what is it telling you? That was today's. That's been a helpful way for me to recalibrate some of the things we do day to day, much less these big intractable challenges. So I'm really excited about a lot of the new technologies that I'm hearing about here. For the first time, there's tremendous new developments in membranes and designer cultures and PFAS remediation. So on that level, it's been really exciting. And it's also really exciting to see some of the new investors coming in to put money into the water market. What's amazing is that, you know, there's always been interest in water as an ESG focus, but these are really technologically savvy investors that know water, that been in water, that launched products, that were on the engineering side, and they're coming in to make investments that are appropriate in terms of the time scales that are necessary for water. And it's been really exciting to see that, that space open up. In one of the previous uh, keynotes about the ecosystem that's under the rivers was very fascinating to me. I mean, I, I've always known you know, about groundwater and groundwater flows. I learned that a long time ago, but I, I never really learned about the ecosystem that would, would exist in that type of matrix. And I thought that was absolutely fascinating. It was terrific. We should stop talking about change things we have to do it. What we've tried to do and also what I've tried to do in the keynote presentation yesterday is to showcase clients that in a very short period of time, if you have the right team together and the right technologies, that you can have big impact. We should stop talking. It's time to act. Do things instead of talking about it. One really interesting perspective I got was from someone who was explaining to me the idea of AI and ML for uh, water treatment systems and they were comparing it or showing a similarity to how Tesla disrupted the car industry and how Tesla basically took the fact of servicing a car, taking it to a dealership, oil changes, all of the dirty work that you have to do for, for uh, maintaining a car and how they kind of cleaned it all up and did it through data, how you can maintain your car through updates and all of those things. And they were basically trying to say, can we not get to this point with AI and ML technologies for water and wastewater treatment? So it was a completely different perspective to everything. You know, I got to go back to Sarah's book, Flourish, this idea of how nature is so smart in terms of the types of, of uh, materials that it can generate from just sort of like four elements mostly, and how as humans we use a lot more and we create materials where the bonds are very hard to break like plastics and nature doesn't do that. They make um, materials where the bonds can be easily broken and rejoined and I think that's just, I don't know, as a, as a background in a, a chemical engineering and chemistry I just found that to be an interesting insight. <laughs>